Father, we thank you this morning for your blood. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made in Christ. That we could stand here in your presence this morning. And God, that we could sing about your mercy and your grace. God, you have been so good to us. And we thank you, Jesus. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. The church said, Amen. Amen. Well, hey, welcome. Welcome to Bridge Church. You guys can have your seats. I know that I am not as uh, handsome or nearly as tall as the uh, normal man standing here, uh, but I'm privileged, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm humbled and honored to be able to share with you guys this morning. My name is Pastor Josh. Um, I pastor a small church in Largo, Florida, over by the ocean, and uh, I love Flagstaff. This is just, it's so beautiful here. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. I had the opportunity to go and check out the Horseshoe Bend yesterday and uh, walked through Antelope Canyon, and uh, it, was, uh, it was just incredible, and I'm so honored to be here. The wild thing is that Pastor Landon and my story, uh, it kind of intertwines in a weird way. Uh, he's on his baby moon right now with, uh, with Emily, and, and they're, they're uh, getting to celebrate the last weekend before, uh, or the last vacation before their baby girl comes, and they're due on September 8th, September 8th. I'm on my baby moon. Yeah. And so my, uh, my beautiful wife, Natalie, over here, um, she's due with our very first baby girl on September 1st. How wild is that? So incredible. So incredible. Uh, you know, and, and I never would have thought uh, not only that, but I never would have thought that I would be a pastor. Uh, pastor Landon, he's, he's been preaching since he was like five. So it was always a part of his future. We all knew that that was going to be a part of him. And, and uh, you know, it's just so cool how God has intertwined our stories and allowed us to, uh, allowed us to come and, and have the honor of sharing with you this morning. I do want to tell you before I go any further, uh, I just want to share some honor for Pastor Landon and Emily. Um, they're just, they're the real deal. And you guys know that. But one of the things that you can't see on your first visit or probably even in your first couple of months of being here is just the integrity and the character that has preceded them for so many years. Um, yeah, you got great pastors. Uh, I've been I've been fortunate enough to, to know them for uh, a little over 20 years, and uh, it, they've always been consistent. They've always loved Jesus. They've always honored him, and uh, it's just, it's incredible to see his calling coming to fruition and getting to uh, to, to shepherd this house, and, and, and again, honor to be here, and so thank you to Pastor Landon and Emily if you guys are watching. You know they're watching. They want to make sure I don't say anything dumb. <laughs> Well, uh, hey, this morning, uh, I want to I wanna share with you uh, a word that, that I, I, I honestly have diligently prayed for the Bridge Church. I've, uh, I've known that I was coming to share a word here for probably the last five months or so, and, uh, and I've prayed for this church. And I was tempted to just share a word that I've already preached before because that would be the easy thing to do. But in my heart and in my, in my preparation, I really felt like the Lord led me in a different direction. And so this word is specifically for Bridge Church. I've never spoke this anywhere else. And, uh, and I want to I wanna tell you up front, it's a little bit more challenging than it is motivational. And I felt the freedom to bring this type of word because I know that Landon, is a, he's an encourager and he's a challenger. He doesn't come up here to, to share stories just to get you excited and get you to leave here feeling good. But he, he shares uh, messages from the word of God to encourage and to challenge us to do what? To grow deeper in our relationship with God. Our goal is that we leave here desiring the Lord more than we did whenever we came in. So this message this morning is, uh, is it's a little bit challenging, um, but I believe that you're going to leave here um, encouraged as well. And, it's, it's, uh, and, and the only thing that I can guarantee you is that it's from the Word of God, and we believe that the Word of God is the truth. And truth, much like surgery, it hurts, but it heals. And so this morning, I'm praying that the Lord use uh, his word to bring healing and challenging in our hearts. And so if you want to turn with me in your Bible, we're going to be in Romans chapter 1. And we're going to start with verse 21, okay? It says this, it says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. This is already dangerous. <laughs> Can you imagine? They knew God, so they knew about him. But they neither glorified him as God nor 
even gave thanks to God for who he was or what he's done. This is already a dangerous place to start. It says, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. I want to highlight that word became because their thinking became futile. It wasn't immediately futile overnight, but how does this happen? This happens with compromise. What happens when we go, you know what? It's just a little bit of sin. It's no big deal. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, a, a Christian, but I begin to compromise with sin that the Bible clearly tells me to stay away from. In fact, the Bible refers to some sin. It says to run from it. But sometimes we go, it's not that big of a deal. And so we compromise. And little by little, just like uh, Paul is speaking here in the book of Romans, he says that their thinking, it became futile. And their hearts, foolish hearts, were darkened. Verse 22, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Don't elbow your neighbor right now, but you know who I'm talking about. They, they claimed to be wise. You know people like this. It says that they claimed to be wise, but they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, and this is one of the scariest scriptures in all of the Bible. It says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. At what point in our lives and in our pursuit of sin does God give us over? to the sinful desires that we pursue. In verse 25, it says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Let's, uh, let's pray this morning as, uh, as we dive into this word. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I believe that if we leave here without another word being said, that we've left with more than we came with. God, we believe that your word does not return void. And I pray that it would go forth and that it would soften our hearts and allow us to leave this place with a desire stronger to pursue you than when we came. We thank you for who you are. We praise you. And we ask that you have your way in the service, Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, has anybody ever played the game Two Truths and a Lie? played it you played it so two truths and a lie is a, is a game that is typically played in order for you to get to know somebody better it's usually an, an icebreaker type of thing and I promise you this has relevance to the message so don't tune out just yet but I, I'd like to share with you my two truths and a lie and the goal is that you'll be able to guess which one is the lie okay so here's my two truths and a lie I danced at a Phoenix Suns halftime show shout out to the Phoenix Suns yeah playoffs all right the refs are on the other team. I'm just saying. All right. But I danced at a halftime show uh, at the Phoenix Suns game. Uh, I, I only have four toes on my left foot, so be careful with my limp. Uh, again, Pastor Landon and me tying together a little bit in a weird way. Uh, and then the last one is that I shot expert uh, when I was in the Army. So that's my, that's my three. What do you believe the, uh, the lie is here? The toes? All right. Phoenix Suns, oh, I got a little bit of everything. So I did shoot expert in the Army. Uh, I, I would have shot 40 of 40, but I shot the same target twice on accident. Um, so I shot expert in the Army, and I did do a little dance at the Phoenix Suns. In fact, Pastor Landon was there. Uh, our, our, uh, our ministry school got the opportunity to do the, the halftime show. So the only way I would ever dance in public is when I'm surrounded by a sea of other people. And uh, we were coordinated steps. So it was, that was a lot of fun. The lie is, is that I do have all uh, five fingers and toes. So praise God uh, for, for that. I couldn't imagine without it. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, the reason I share that today is because the message that I want to speak on is uh, I actually want to flip it a little bit, and I want to speak on two lies and one truth. I believe that there are dangerous lies that has not only impacted the world, but it's found its way in to the church. And when we believe lies, and, and like it said in, in, uh, in Romans chapter 1, it says, when they exchange the truth about God for a lie, we find ourselves in a dangerous place. And even when it's a hard truth, wouldn't you prefer that someone be honest with you? 
It's like whenever you leave a Chipotle and you have some of the green stuff stuck in your teeth. It's hard to be the one that says, hey, you got some of that stuff in your teeth. Because you understand, it's just awkward. But you know what? It's a good friend that will call that out and let you know. Praise God. I I don't want to operate under a a, a lie or a perceived truth of myself. I want to have an accurate idea of, of who I am. And especially when it comes to things of eternity. How much more important? Leave the green stuff in the teeth, man. Tell them about the, about the Bible. Tell them about Jesus and about the truth of God's word and who he is. And so this morning, if you find yourself offended, uh, you can email me at landon at bridgechurch.com, and I will respond promptly. Uh, but but uh, I believe that it will be encouraging for you this morning, too. But it starts off a little harsh. The first lie that we need to address and that we have to talk about in the church is this. You are not a good person. The lie is that you are a good person, but the truth is we're not good people. And and I'm going to go ahead and publicly tell you about how I'm not a good person because the thing is, I thought I was. In fact, I was in ministry school, uh, and when I showed up to ministry school, guess who one of my leaders was? Pastor Landon. I mean, I had all of the tools for success. I was, I was going to be a good person if anybody was going to be a good person. And in fact, one day I was walking down the sidewalk and this person was holding up a $20 bill and they said, I'll give this $20 bill to anybody who can prove that they're a good person. And I was like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm broke with a capital B. I'm in ministry school. Like, I'm a good person. I've memorized 300 scriptures. I, I, took a, I, I moved from Florida to pursue a relationship with God at this ministry school. Like, I, I pray every day. I'm a good person. And I can prove it. So the guy, you know, slick, man. I was so mad because I never even got the $20 but he was, he was holding that up, and he says, all right, Josh, is your name Josh? All right, cool. He said, Josh, uh, let me ask you a question. Have you ever, have you ever lied? I'm like, <laughs> who hasn't? I mean, I don't lie often or regular, but yeah, I've lied at some point. And he's like, well, what does that make you? Uh, a, a liar. And he's like, yes. I see where this is going. This is not good. He says, Joshua, have you ever stolen anything before? And I was like, oh, no, he ain't getting me on this. I never stole anything. I've never, never stolen anything. And he goes, really? Oh, okay. What about like uh, downloaded music from LimeWire or Napster? This is a long time ago. I was like, you got me. I did, I did, I did steal that. And he goes, what does that make you? And I was nervous, so I said, a stealer? <laughs> He's like, no, man, it's, you're, you're a thief. And so uh, he continued on and he said, Josh, have you ever looked at a woman with lust? I was like, yeah, yeah, I have. He goes, so by your own admission, you're a lying, thieving adulterer. You still think you're a good person? And the truth kind of hit me and I realized, no, I'm I'm not a good person. I'm a saved person by the grace of Jesus Christ. And the thing is, It was never my goodness that saved me to begin with. But the thing is, if you go around and you begin to ask people, hey, do you believe in heaven or hell? Uh, They would tell you, yeah, I believe in heaven or hell. And and, and if you were to ask people 10 times out of 10, where do you think you're going? Oh, I'm going to heaven. Well, why? Because I'm a good person. This lie is so detrimental Because when we believe that we are good people and that it is our goodness and our efforts that are going to allow us a place in the kingdom of God, then we neglect our necessity for Jesus Christ. Therefore, debunking the gospel in its entirety. And so I have to be able to say, I'm not a good person. In fact, Romans 3.23 confirms this. It says, for all. Look at your neighbor and tell them all. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I found out that it is true that I oftentimes judge other people by their actions while I judge myself by my intentions. Oh, but Josh, you you, you did this thing and it was bad. Yeah, but you don't understand. Let me explain it. This was my heart. It doesn't matter. You've done bad things because you're a bad person. Let me exchange the word bad for you are not a righteous person. The Bible says that our righteousness 
on our best day, when we've read the word, we've attended three services, praise God for these uh, interns and the people who work here. I mean, they got to sit through this three times. Even on your best day, your righteousness, it's as of filthy rags. We can never achieve goodness or righteousness on our own merit. It's only because of the blood of Jesus. Mark 10, verse 18, it says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered. A Pharisee was coming to him, and he was trying to trap him, and he, he asked him, what must I do to inherit the uh, eternal heaven, a uh, good, good teacher? And he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And this is essential to the gospel. You know, we're reading, uh, we're reading and going through a series at, at our church in Florida in the book of Judges. And uh, if I'm going to give you any, like, homework today, go and read the book of Judges. It is just one of the things that I see as a constant in there is I see over and over and over again. I'm literally telling you multiple times in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Over and over, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then the Lord rescued them. And they did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord rescued them. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm reading through this, and we're, we're teaching on this, and I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself bewildered and even frustrated with the Israelites. In fact, if you go back from uh, the book of Judges into the book of Genesis and we see when God is rescuing the Israelites out of Egypt, could you imagine being one of the Israelites, having been enslaved, your family, your mom, your mom's mom, your great-grandmother, everyone that you know has been enslaved for 400 years in Egypt, and, and you see all 10 plagues come through. And they affect all of the Egyptians, but they don't touch God's people, your family, your people. Imagine just how much you would think and understand God's protection is over us. And then they, 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 uh, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and they're probably walking away with some boldness like, yeah, nothing can touch us. And then they get to the Red Sea, and immediately they turn around and huff and puff at Moses. Did you just bring us out here to kill us? And even in their lack of faith, even in their frustration towards their leader and towards God, what does he do? He makes a way where there was no way. He opens up the Red Sea, and they're, they're able to walk through it on dry ground. And as soon as they get to the other side, every one of their pursuers, their enemies, their persecutors, God caused the sea to come back together, and they were gone. And then just a couple of days later, we see Moses go up on Mount Sinai to speak with God and get the Ten Commandments. And what do the Israelites do? I can't see God. And Moses, our leader, he's gone for a couple of hours. So let's make a golden calf that we can give our worship and attention to. You, you read this and you're just like, how dumb are you? And then it's like the Holy Spirit just checks you and goes, I made a way where there was no way for you. I, I've, I've rescued you. I have provided for you. I have been there for you. And still, you find yourself in a cycle of returning to your sinful ways. And as much as I hate to admit it, I relate with the Israelites more than I would ever want to admit. They had good moments, but they had bad patterns. The beauty of all of this is that even with the evil that they continued to turn to, they were still God's people. Why? Because he had a covenant with Abraham. And then he said, as, as long as your people are on this earth, they're my people. He had a covenant with them. And so to be clear this morning, I didn't just come to tell you that you're a bad person. I'm not that, I'm not that mean. But I did come to remind us as the church that it is not our goodness that saves us. I want to clarify that no one is without sin and that we need Jesus. And the beautiful thing is God continued to rescue Israel. You see this pattern over and over and over again. And what happened is they would do evil in the eyes of the Lord. They would get oppressed because just like in Romans, it, 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 said, it said that he gave them over to their sinful desires. And what happened 
is when they were given over to their sinful desires and they were oppressed by, by Egypt or Babylon or any other number of kings that, that oppressed the Israelites, they would cry out to God for help. And I'm telling you, within two verses, almost every time, God sent Gideon, God sent Deborah, God sent Mo, like God sent, he responded. And this is the awesome thing is that, that their oppression and their freedom was directly linked with the amount of time it took for them to repent. What does repentance require? Repentance requires understanding, I'm not a good person. I've messed up and I've failed you, God. Would you come and rescue me because you're the only one who can? It requires repentance. And I'm telling you today, if you're sitting in oppression if you're sitting in a place in life where you're going, it seems like it never lets up. Have you considered that maybe it's time to repent and ask God to lead you in the way of the everlasting? So that's lie number one, that you're a good person. Lie number two, I really wanted to change the wording of this, but um, I, I just got to give it to you like it, like it is. Um, lie number two, God will not punish you. If I said it this way, uh, God loves you and approves of you just as you are. That's a lie. That's a, that's a lie from the pit of hell that has convinced Christians to have a religion with God and not a relationship with God. You know, I, I grew up, <laughs> yeah, amen. I grew up in a church that constantly told me that I was going to hell. They only preached hellfire and brimstone and they never preached the the mercy and the love and the goodness of god you understand there's a there's a balance here the full gospel entails both but i grew up in a church that only gave me one side and every week i remember coming to youth group and they were just like if you're having sex you're going to hell you know if you're smoking pot you're going to hell like they they just they gave me the harsh man i was like I remember thinking I went to youth group and I was like, you know what? What if I read my Bible this week? What if I, what if I prayed and I was a good Christian young man? I wasn't, but what if, what if I was? I'm still going to come to church and just get bashed over the head with, with this, this hurtful, you know, side. I'm only getting to see one side of who God is. Well, what that did is that created a whole generation of believers that said, we don't need to talk about the wrath of God. We want to talk about the goodness of God. He's a loving God. And while that's true, he loves us. The Bible even says that he, even while we were still sinners, he died for us. So does God love us just the way we are? Absolutely. But without giving context to that, we find ourselves in danger. Because the context is that God does love us just as we are. But he doesn't approve of us just the way we are. The Bible said that Jesus came that we may have life and have life more abundant. Meaning that he has more for us than just saying a sinner's prayer and continuing to live our life the way that we want to live it. He's got something deeper for us, church. And we can't believe in this lie that would have us continuing to live and operate and celebrate our sin. It's a foolish thing to believe that God has no standard. This promotes a Christianity that just makes me feel good. And I'll feel good right into chapter 7 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is an important part right here. Listen, it says, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22 says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. I'm being honest. <laughs> this this passage of scripture is like, why is that in the Bible? That's, that, that, that immediately, even as a pastor, it makes me stop and begin to ask myself, am I doing the will of the Father? Have I allowed him to come in and be more than just Savior? Everyone loves the Savior part. But the Bible refers to him as Lord and Savior. Lord implies that I give my will up to follow his will. 
It implies that I would surrender my lifestyle of sin and wickedness. I love calling him Savior. But am I willing to call him Lord? Who does the will of the Father? John chapter 15 gives this beautiful picture. It says that if you abide with me, I will abide with you. The people who do the will of the Father are ones who know him, ones who have relationship with him, who walk with him, and who align their wills with his wills. Jesus even teaches us in the Lord's Prayer. He says, pray like this, our Father, hallowed be your name. He's saying, hey, start your prayer off with recognizing that even the name of God is holy. Hallowed be your name. And then what? Your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. He's teaching us, hey, even in your prayers, come to God in a way of saying, I surrender, Lord, to your ways. Why? You know, what God wants for us is so much better than what we want for us. You know, I convinced myself as a kid that the best life that I could possibly live is to eat chocolate chip cookies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Come on, somebody. And different types, right? So I would have some Oreos with milk in the morning. Come on, you put the fork on it and put it down in there so it gets nice and soggy. And then, and, and then I would have some chocolate chip cookies from Chips Ahoy for lunch. And then I would bake some beautiful, delicious cookies for dinner. I was like, this is the best way to live. But my father, who, who is not, uh, you know, God, who, who, is, who is just a normal man, he looked at me and he recognized, Josh, what you want for you is going to cause destruction and hurt and pain in your life. If I refuse to, if, if I let you eat all of this and don't give you the nutrients that you need, what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to enjoy life the way that you want to enjoy life. You're going to get sick. You're going to get obese. You're, you're going to have problems that are going to lead to an early death. My father recognized that what I wanted for me was not what was best for me. And the Bible says that his ways are higher than our ways. Right? And so when I look at God and, and I go, but Lord, I, I, I just, I want to I wanna live life the way I want to. You know, I want, I want to have premarital sex. I want to, I want to do drugs. I, I, want, I, want to, I, I want to live life the way I want. I, I found all the things that are pleasurable. And God goes, respect those things in the way and in the manner that I created them, and it will serve you well. When you indulge yourselves in things that I have called good and you allow them to be perverted, it's going to lead to destruction in your life. And here I'm going, oh my gosh, what God wants for me is better for me than what I could ever want for myself. And so I have to find myself in a place of going, you know what? Punishment will come. Repercussions for my sin will come. And I don't serve God just out of fear, but it's an element. In Proverbs 9 verse 10, it says that fear is the beginning of wisdom. One of the questions I always get whenever I hear this verse is people go, why in the world would I want to serve a God that I fear? Why would I ever want to serve a God that I have fear for? And I immediately thought about my relationship with my father. Imperfect, but he was a great dad, and I was blessed to be raised in this way that I never once, even in discipline, questioned how much my dad loved me. I knew that he would give his life for mine in a heartbeat. That was never a question. But I also knew that if I disobeyed my father, that I was going to get the swift hand across my behind. And I swear, he had, like, stones in his hands or something. It was, it was in, incredibly uh, um, effective. And so I knew that if I disobeyed my father, that I was going to have repercussions. And so I had reverence for my father. I had a fear, of a healthy fear, of, of disobeying him. And at the same time, I felt protected, provided for, loved, and it's in the same way with our relationship with God. If there's no reverence for who he is, at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, that's what they said. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks. How could I have a relationship with the Father who created all things, who has a purpose for my life, and not have reverence for him? And if I find myself in this place, 
Here's the pattern that you're going to see this morning. How do I fix that? I repent. Repentance recognizes that I'm not a good person. I can't do it on my own. And repentance recognizes that it is God who gives me the mercy and the grace to earn me a place in the kingdom of God. And so this morning I want to recap the two big lies is number one, that you're a good person. Number two, that God will not punish you. And I want to share one truth with you this morning. And it's the, and it's the truth is the only thing that matters. And most of you have probably recognized and memorized this scripture. It's in John 3.16. This truth changes everything. It says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. This truth changes everything. He loved us enough to send his son to die for us. And you know what the thing is? I, I think that in Christianity and in our walks, we kind of get wrapped up in this idea of I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do better. I'm going to will myself into uh, being sinless or, or having this, this, uh, this holier-than-thou lifestyle. I'm going to try harder. But it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. And who are you? John 8, 32, it says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Sometimes a shift in perspective, a revelation of truth and knowledge changes the way that we live. When I was in ministry school, I, I remember I was so broke, man. I, I, I Capital B for sure. I had no money. I remember scrounging quarters because it was cheaper for me to go to McDonald's and get a McDouble than it was to go to the grocery store and buy a PB&J. And I remember scrounging these quarters together and going into McDonald's to buy my McDouble and, and temporarily satisfy the hunger that I had. And imagine with me for just a moment that I had uh, recently played the lottery and that I had a winning ticket in my back pocket for over a million dollars. If I had the revelation knowledge that I had a million dollars in my back pocket, it would have changed what I ordered. I would have got no McDouble. I would have got a Big Mac. In fact, I probably would have got two, and I would have shared with everybody that was in the restaurant. I might have bought McDonald's. I don't know. But it would have changed the way that I lived. It would have changed the way I walked into the place. It would have changed my thought process. And this morning, if you don't know the truth about what God has done through Jesus Christ for you, then you're operating under a mentality that your works and your goodness are going to get you to a place of heaven. But this revelation knowledge, I realize I'm a son of the living God. And as a son of the living God, I don't pursue things that my God hates. I'm aligning my will with his. I want to love what he loves, and I want to hate what he hates. Why? Because of who I am, not because of what I do. I didn't do good things to become a Christian. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ to become a Christian. And what I do flows out of the identity that he has created anew in my heart. And so this morning, I don't know where you're at. I, I, all I know is that the Lord put this word on my heart for this church. Then I can tell you that you are not here by, by chance this morning. Maybe it's your very first time. And the Lord wanted you to know this morning that he loves you. And that you can stop trying to make it on your own. And that you can freely receive the gift of salvation this morning. Maybe you're a Christian and you've been a Christian for a long time. And I pray that this word challenges you the way that it did me in Matthew chapter 7. You know the people who said, Lord, Lord, do I not prophesy in your name? Guess what? They were not just believing that they were Christians. They were operating and working in ministry. They prophesied in the name of Jesus, cast out demons in the name of Jesus. But they found themselves void of a relationship. And one way that I recognize that I'm void of a relationship and I'm living in religion is that I find ways to justify my sin instead of surrendering my sin. And this morning, just like it says in Psalm 139, 
David says this prayer at the end of the chapter, and this is my heart for us this morning. He says, Lord, test me. Try me. And, 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 and search me and know me is what he says. Search me and know me. Test me and, and see if there's any way in me that is wrong. And he says, lead me in the way of the everlasting. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years. If you could say that prayer with me this morning, like David did, then you're on a place of willing to surrender your life and your ways and your will to a holy God who loves you, who called you and has purpose for you. And so this morning, would you bow your heads with me? I just want to pray for you. And I want to remind you that you have a prayer team that comes up here immediately following this that would love to pray with you. If you want to accept Christ, come and do that this morning. But Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would just be with us in this place. Lord, I pray that a, a healthy level uh, of conviction from the Holy Spirit would come into our hearts. And Lord, that if there's walls built up, that we would be willing to surrender. Lord, and simply say this prayer that David said, God, search me and know me. God, expose to me any ways that I'm living that is not honoring to you. And Lord, lead me in the way of the everlasting. Remind me this morning that it's not on my strength or my will, but God, it's on you and the grace and the mercy that you provide. We thank you for that. We love you and we put our trust and our hope in you this morning. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And the church said, amen. Give it up for the word, amen. Thank you, Pastor Josh. What a challenging and encouraging word today. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us. We are going to dismiss service, and I just pray that you are encouraged. Go home today, do the homework, right? Read Judges and just feel that encouragement that and the weight that's taken off, that we didn't do anything to deserve it. We can't earn it. Jesus paid it all, amen, but to draw into relationship with him and into his arms today. So we hope that you have a blessed week. Make sure we have Tuesday night prayer, midweek service, all the amazing things happening here. Stay connected, but let's speak this bridge declaration over ourselves and be dismissed. I am a bridge builder. This is my season of favor. I am blessed to live my best. I will choose to love him first. I will worship fully, love deeply, and my community will thrive because I am praying for it. I am a carrier of peace. I will represent God's gentleness to myself and others. I will live out his gospel. I am blessed to live my best because I am a bridge builder. Amen. We love you, Bridge Fam. We're so glad you joined us today. If you made a spiritual decision, whether that was dedicating your life to Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, send us an email at info at weirbridge.church and let us know you made that spiritual decision. Also, if you're joining our Bridge Church family online for the first time, we have a very special gift for you. Send us an email at info at wearebridge.church to share some information on where we can send you that gift. We're so glad you joined us today, and we can't wait to see you soon. Be sure to stay connected, because we're so much better. Together. Yeah.